Uh, OK, here is a conversation that is going to be fascinating, but which I feel somewhat unqualified to conduct. Um, uh, Tim Gregory is a nuclear chemist working at Sellafield and the author of a new book, Going Nuclear, How the Atom Will Save the World. And it's an absolute pleasure to see you, Tim. Oh, thanks for the invitation. How did you become a nuclear scientist? Um, I always loved science as a kid, and I guess you had to pick something. And <laughs> uh, so I did geology for my undergraduate degree, discovered the joys of geochemistry, fell in love with the lab and then a few sideways career switches and ended up working in a nuclear lab measuring the chemistry and the radioactivity of all sorts of interesting materials. And what uh, brings you to this conclusion? This is about uh, uh, essentially um, redefining the conversation about environmental challenge. Yeah, for sure. I, I mean, the thing that brought me to science was the interest, but one of the best things about science and technology is that if we implement them properly in society, we can make the world a better place. And nuclear science is a perfect example of that, not least because it has the power to completely replace fossil fuels, which of course are causing global warming, air pollution, ocean acidification in this, this, this journey towards net zero that the UK and, and lots of other countries are now going on. Yes, Nuclear plays an important part in that, and, and I think that um, it, it, the record needs to be set straight which is my motivation for writing the book. Yes, so what is wrong at the moment with the record? Is it, is it an almost sort of spooky response to the word nuclear? Everybody starts worrying about... Yeah, it's uh, got terrible PR. Chernobyl ...and, and uh, 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 animals with 17 <laughs> legs and all that kind of thing. Yeah, for sure. It, right. it's, got, it's got terrible PR. And when you look at the data, um, it's not only the safest way to generate power, it's actually on a par with wind and solar in terms of its safety record. Um, but it's also, by virtually every metric, the most environmentally friendly way to generate power. It doesn't emit carbon dioxide, it uses barely any land, and because of the, the huge huge amount of energy you get from a very small amount of uranium. You need barely any mining as well. And so it's an obvious replacement for fossil fuels as we try to get rid of them. Well, scratch my slightly glib comment about animals with 17 legs. Why, why do you think that the PR, so to speak, remains so negative, even as the science has become close to irrefutable? The history of nuclear power generation is a yeah. little bit like the history of aviation, right? I mean, just last week we had, we had, we had an aeroplane crash, horrible, and, and it, it's still in the news now. And mm. a lot of people have a fear of flying, even though by, by the data, it's, it's virtually the safest way to travel. It's far safer than a car, which, which is probably the most dangerous thing that most people do every day. But very few people have a fear of driving a car. And so there's this, this, mm. this kind of meme in society that nuclear power is, is dangerous and it's bad for the environment. There's this pervasive... And we can't separate it from bombs in our mind. Perhaps. You can. You, well, OK, so th there's a, there's an unfortunate kind of, of a, a tangle between yeah. between atomic weapons and nuclear power reactors, and comparing the two is a bit like comparing a tea light with a with a stick of dynamite. You've uh, used that line before. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> definitely. Uh, nuclear reactors they release their energy slowly over okay. many many years um, to produce the power on which peaceful society depends and prosperous society as well. So w what you're calling for is a is a refocusing of priorities. Definitely, yes. I, I would love to see more nuclear power, not just in the UK and across Europe, but North America and the rest of the world again. How, how, how commonplace is your position? Because, I mean, the, 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 the book is subtitled How the Atom Will Save the World. So you, you, you are coming from an evangelical position. You're evangelising for, for nuclear power. Is yours a lonely position or, or would most people in the sector agree that this is something that needs the public needs to be persuaded in, interestingly there's, there's quite a lot of public support in the uk yeah. for nuclear power despite the meme that it's got this really fierce opposition um a yougov poll which i, I make a habit of tracking um shows that about 50 percent of people in the uk either strongly support or okay. tend to support nuclear oh, that power. surprises me and only eight percent strongly opposed so it's actually mm. a minority view and Last week with the announcement that Sizewell C is going ahead in Suffolk and that Rolls-Royce will be deploying small modular reactors up and down the country. There's government support there as well and private sector support. And the truth is, we, we you know, no country has achieved net zero fundamentally. It's incredibly, incredibly difficult. We've only been trying to do Who's it. Who's winning? Um, it depends by what metric. France is doing pretty well. Is it? Um, France built 55 nuclear reactors in the 70s, 80s and 90s. Um, it's only built one since, uh, but all 55 
five of those nuclear reactors are still working, which is why France has got some of the cleanest electricity in Europe. I didn't know. And actually in 2005, France got 80% of its electricity from nuclear power. It almost decarbonised its grid by accident before climate change became the hot topic that it is today. And so the science, the science is there and so is the precedent. We've actually done this before. And how do you, I mean, account for uh, the... the prioritization that's currently given to, to to wind and solar you you it's not just about because everyone kind of agrees that fossil fuels need to be phased out everyone except donald trump and nigel Farage, pretty much but you also point out in the book that um solar and and wind power are not as green as they're sometimes portrayed as being you're, yeah. you're a massive um nuclear power head if there was something better than nuclear power, I would be advocating for that. All I want is lots of energy yes. that's cheap and that's green. And nuclear power is our best shot at doing uh, that. Uh, but, but that involves being a little bit more negative than, than people committed to clean energy usually are towards wind and solar. Yeah, for sure. Why? The, why, why is that? Well, Because they're not as green as they're portrayed to be. No. So when you look at the, the relatively small amounts of power that wind turbines and solar panels generate, you need quite a lot of mining to, to, to exhume the minerals from which mm. you make this infrastructure and that, that mining footprint doesn't get diluted as much as you would think by the amount of power that they generate. But I will just add that by virtually every metric, they are more environmentally friendly than fossil of fuels. Of course, yes. I, I mean, it's, it, it, it's not quite easy the raw, but it is a, 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 like a league table, if you like. For sure. And there's, it's very difficult to compensate for the intermittence of wind and solar. What do we do on days when the wind isn't blowing, and especially in winter when the sun isn't shining? Definitely up north where I live, it's, it's dark all the time. You need that reliable power to jump in and support that renewable intermittence. And in the absence of fossil fuels, that means nuclear. What about the waste? A lot of people are texting in to... In fact, let me just help you sell your book to them. Well, he'll answer all of these questions <laughs> in Going Nuclear, How the Atom Will Save the World by Tim Gregory. But while we have you, I think I'm, I'm in my early 50s, so I'm older than you, and I have a, a, an almost a muscle memory of nuclear waste being yeah. something that was going to be of enormous da danger and harm to the world. Yeah, for sure. It's a challenge. Um, it's interesting when you look at the, the energy density of nuclear fuel, the amount of power you can get from a tiny amount of uranium, the natural conclusion of that is that you get a very small amount of waste for a huge amount of energy. And so if you generated all of your power over your entire lifetime from nuclear alone, forget renewables, forget fossil fuels, 100% nuclear-powered lifetime, you couldn't even fill a wine glass with the amount of nuclear waste that you produce. It's, it's actually not that much. As for what to do with it, because you can't just trivialise it out of existence. No, of it's radioactive for a long time. Finland last year opened the world's first and currently only geological repository for nuclear waste. So they will basically bury it. And the thing with nuclear waste, like all radioactive substances, is that they get less radioactive with time. They decay. And so in about 100,000 years, something like that, it won't be nuclear waste anymore. It will just be waste. Okay, so you're not I mean, and again, you address... All, you're getting loads of questions, actually. Oh, it's, it's a, well, I mean, it goes to show that there's a need for... for Absolutely. Um, for, and some criticism. So deal with this from Fiona. Nuclear is expensive and slow to build. It needs loads of water, so it will be built near rapidly rising seas and eroding coastlines, and it's vulnerable during wars. In fact, a few people have asked what happens if one gets bombed. We need to invest the money in and time in tidal, solar and wind, and we need to reduce demand. So, first of all, it's going to be... You're up for this. Uh, I yeah, love this. You're absolutely <laughs> buzzing. <laughs> Come on, Absolutely. then. <laughs> um, the reason it takes a long time often is because we just don't do it enough. And when you look at the history of nuclear power, build times, countries that build at pace, build at scale as well. It would be a bit like if Ford only made one car a month. It would take them forever. The fact that they're constantly building them means that they do it quickly. And so when we look over to China and South Korea, build yeah. times are actually coming down. And, and, and this is where there's, there's a sort of global dimension to it all. But in the, the more you do it, the, 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 the better you get at it. It. So Hinkley Point C is running massively behind schedule and over budget because it would be like asking me to start building a car now and, and comparing it with Ford. For sure, I wasn't even two years old when Britain last connected a nuclear power station to the grid. That was size well B in 1995. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's been it's been too long. We've, we've lost the art and the spirit. And, and how do we get it back? Um, do more of it, for sure. Is it and, that simple? Yeah, I think it is. Uh, that's what the history suggests anyway. And it's not just the large, kind of traditional gigawatt-style massive power stations. It's the small modular reactors as well. And this is what's new this time around. These small modular 
modular reactors, the idea is that you can build 80-85% of the reactor on a factory line. And just like you might assemble IKEA furniture um, in, 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 in your flat and you transport it in the back of your car, the idea is that you can apply the same logic to nuclear reactors. So what are the downsides? Of nuclear? Yeah. I think the biggest downside to nuclear is that when it does overrun, it tends to get expensive. But I think... Well, well we come so back it's not to your answer to the last question. When you look at the history of nuclear power, countries that do it at scale do it quickly and within budget as well. Um, you've, I've already got some fans as well, I should make that clear. I'm so happy to be hearing this given our time. Uh, nuclear is the answer in the immediate term. In 50 years' time, solar and wind might be good enough to replace it, but we're just not there yet. Nuclear is a mature technology and we're good at building them. Get started yesterday. Yeah, for sure. It's like, it's like the old kind of um, fortune cookie slip, the, the best time to plant a tree is yesterday, yes. the second best time is today. Um, Martin picks on something that you address very directly in the book, and, and I love that his use of the phrase rightly or wrongly here, because it, it's very pertinent. Chernobyl, rightly or wrongly, is the fear. Did you coin the word radiophobia? Or no, I that? didn't. Radiophobia is kind of out there. But that's it, it, what we're well, talking about. Yeah, for sure. So it's interesting. Europe actually built more nuclear reactors in the five years leading up to Chernobyl than it's built since. And so it really is no stretch to say that it was Chernobyl that kind of put an end to nuclear power expansion in Europe. Um, when you look at the fatalities from Chernobyl, and I don't want to... I mean, you've got a chapter it, called We Need to Talk About Chernobyl. There's a whole just, chapter. Just to reassure Martin <laughs> yes, that you're on top of this. I don't... It's very, it's very sensitive because you don't want to diminish it. You no. don't want to trivialise it because every, every death... Chernobyl was avoidable, ultimately. Yes. But when you look at the deaths from nuclear power, they are vastly diluted by the enormous amount of power you get from a single nuclear reactor. Again, it's like aviation. It's an impeccable safety record punctuated by very infrequent but very high-profile one-off events. I... I, I I salute your sensitivity. It's really, really difficult to do that because, uh, I, I mean, the numbers absolutely support your position, so you're not in any way trivialising that. But but the impacts of Chernobyl and, and, and Fukushima as well. For sure. Which I think, there's only one fatality at Fukushima? Uh, that's right, yes. And, and, it's, it's and about it's, 50 for Chernobyl. Um, it, it was between 30 and 40 in the immediate aftermath. Right. And then there were, there were a, maybe something like a few hundred, maybe up to a thousand latent cancers amongst the wider population as a consequence of Chernobyl, something like that. Um, that's from a, a, a UN commission yes. report, actually, that, that kind of, it was it was written and compiled by a big consortium of scientists um, from multiple countries, including the countries that were affected as well. And so the, this, it's not it's not kind of downplayed or, or trivialised and diminished. And, and, and what about, and this is sadly timely, uh, more, and it wasn't when you wrote the book, but it, we are seeing nuclear facilities being targeted by ordnance at the moment in the Middle East. What, what, what about the dangers? An awful lot of people wondering about what happens if someone tries to bomb a power plant. Yeah, it, it's interesting. You, you could say, you could make the same argument for all sorts of public infrastructure. I mean, what, what if you bombed a dam, for example, um, as, as happened in the 70s in, in mm. China? It wasn't bombed, but it, it, uh, the Banqiao Dam burst and killed millions and millions of people. Um, in, in, a, in a technological world, things tend to get concentrated and they can become targets of war. Um, interestingly, the new European power reactors designed by EDF, which is what Hinkley Point C actually is and what Sizewell C will be, um, are aeroplane proof. They've been tested for aeroplanes being flying into them. So, so I think we're okay. okay no, well, <laughs> Not about this. No, abs abs absolutely. <laughs> And um, finally, probably, Tim, because we're out of time, how, how, how do you deal with or do, do you bother trying to deal with the, the sort of political voices that are um, dismissive of, of the need for net zero, either, either climate change deniers or people who don't think that we should be searching quite so hard for alternatives to fossil fuels? I would say that even if you don't care about net zero or maybe even don't even believe in climate change there are other reasons for ditching fossil fuels as well namely air pollution and all of the land that we have to turn to mine fossil fuels because although i've met climate change deniers and net zero deniers um i haven't met anybody who doesn't want to see a greener world that's more prosperous and can flourish and that's what nuclear power can give us. And so I hope that it has um, appealed to kind of people of all kind of political persuasions. This isn't a left-right issue. Um, this is about as fundamental as things like clean water. Yeah, I, 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 Jimmy, clean electricity. You, you've won Jimmy over. I wish politicians answered like scientists. Informed facts over <laughs> uninformed opinions. Great guest. Um, who's the book for? Um, this is for people who want to live in a more prosperous world, a cleaner world, and are perhaps a little bit curious or want to have a second think about nuclear power. You might be surprised. And um, it's, 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 
I certainly felt more optimistic about Net Zero after writing this book than I did before. I used to think it probably wasn't even possible, but now roll on net zero by 2050 absolutely right we'll get you back <laughs> we'll get you back to mark your homework tim gregory thanks ever so much Go, going nuclear how the atom will save the world is out now and you're off back to sellerfield are you I am, yeah <laughs> bon voyage